Diva. Meet Latifah Scott Jackson, a story of death, drugs, and prison. From the church to the streets to a life of empowerment, here is her story on the other side. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you might be. My name is Marva B. I am the CEO and founder of Black Link Magazine. We are a national publication and we are everywhere. So we are so excited to have this interview tonight. And we just like to welcome you to Black Link Ma Magazine. Um, thank you for saying yes to this interview. Most definitely. Thank you for having me. And thank you for um, giving me an opportunity to grace your platform. I love sharing my story. I love encouraging people. And it's just what it's all about for me. Yeah, well, I'm excited. Like, I could not wait for this interview. Of course, I got a little snippet of your story. And I'm like, yes, the answer is yes. Yes and yes. So <laughs> we right. are excited to hear your story and get it out to people where it will touch people's lives. Um, so if you will, go ahead and officially just introduce yourself. Tell the people who you are and what you do. Well, I am Letitia Scott Jackson. I'm the visionary of Keeping Families Connected. I am the host of Leticia Talks radio show and um, slash podcast, and I'm just, I'm I'm saved. I'm a I'm a believer. I'm a wife. I'm a mother. I'm a grandmother. I'm a musician for the church. I'm a four time published author. Um, I'm an overcomer, most importantly, and I'm just excited just to be assigned to the assignment that God has assigned for me to do because a lot of people. They wouldn't last eight months. Let me tell you something. Some businesses do not does not last eight months. And I've been doing this for eight years now as far as um, providing the services for keeping families connected. And believe it or not, I do it with my own money. I've been doing it for eight years. My husband gives me an allowance. And 10% of what he makes, I spend on other people. That's amazing. That is amazing. And that's why you continue to be blessed. Um, yes. you know, even the Bible says that it's better to give than to receive. So I'm, I'm loving it. I'm loving it already. So let's just, let's just get into the interview and let's just start back. Let's just go all the way back. You know, let's talk about your growing up and your childhood and how that was for you. Well, I did this. So ironic, we get to do this interview the day after I get back from home. I went to Louisiana on Monday, um, to go change the flowers on my son's grave and my dad's grave and, and it always, it's always emotional for me. It took me a long time to get to the point where I could go and visit the grave site because my son was my only son when he, and he was killed at the age of 17. And, it's, and then my dad was a preacher. So I grew up in the house with a father being an African Methodist Episcopal pastor. A lot of people don't know what that means. You know, they say, oh, it's the CME church. It's the AME church. So that CME was for Christian Methodist Episcopal and the AME was for African Methodist Episcopal. Mm -hmm. And so when they were in this um, this church, um, I don't want to call it the organization, but what congregation or how it was with that ministry, wherever they sent my dad to preach, we had to move there. So we either stayed behind the church or on side of the church when I was growing up. And I hated that. You know, I did an interview and I did a, 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 a snippet of a docu-series and it showed me walking by my dad's old church in Louisiana. Oh. And I said every day when we would walk home from school, we would pass the house up so people wouldn't know that we stayed in that shotgun house behind the church. But how long can you hide from your friends? that you stay behind the church, especially if they stay down in the street or around the corner. Right. So we grew up um, in church. I started playing the piano for the church at the age of 12. I woke up out of my sleep. It was my gift. And I've never had a lesson to this day. So I play piano, violin, organ, guitar, drums, um, you name it. If I hear it, I can play it. Oh my God. Yes, and so I woke up sleepwalking and I was playing my dad's favorite song and I thought I was dreaming. And so my mom, she was my dad's musician and I always make people laugh because she played strictly by music. And I felt like people that played strictly by music was the slowest of the stars. <laughs> <laughs> they, 
her and my grandmother both played by music. And if the music fall, if the sheet music fall off the organ or the piano, they messed up. <laughs> and so that was never me. I never wanted to do nothing. As a matter of fact, I never wanted to play music, period. Because my dad sent me to lessons at the age of six to my grandmother, who was my mom's mom. And my mom was her only daughter. She had two brothers and she was the oldest. And my grandmother was so mean, God rest her soul. She was she was a serious teacher. So if she catch you not looking at the music, she wrapped you with a switch. People mm -hmm. don't, these kids nowadays don't even know about it. I don't switch. understand that, no, no. They don't know what a switch is. Know. And so she would have three switches tied together. And if I miss a note or if I look out, I was playing from memory. So I never could read the music. I didn't know the notes. So I would just watch her hands and remember what she would show me. And I would go back and mimic it. And then when she catch me not looking at the music, she grabbed me. So my dad, him and her was not always at the best of, you know, on the best of terms. So I told him one day, like, oh, I don't like going over there. She's mean. You know, I was six, seven years old. And he stopped me from going. I never wanted to play no more. But God said, hey, this is your gift. Right. And you know what they say about our gifts. Our gifts makes room for us and it brings us before a great men women people always say when they say men that doesn't mean a male factor that mean that your gift brings you before great people right. of god so i've been able to be in rooms with people and to you know play for dorothy norwood and all of these people um because of my gift so i'm grateful for that and my dad he wasn't um a well-to-do person we didn't have a lot of money and he was, um, but he always, I was telling my uncle yesterday, he always made ends meet. Mm -hmm. We always had clean clothes. We always had food on the table. Um, the church members always had to help us. You yeah. know, they would help him because he was their pastor. And I didn't like growing up like that. So at the age of 16, I became a drug dealer. Mm -hmm. So I played basketball. I was an honor roll student. I ran track. Every Sunday morning, his best friend would pick me up and I would go to his church and play for his church because my mom played for my dad's church. I was telling my husband that yesterday because my husband has never struggled in life. He, he, this is the truth. He's been one of those people. He was blessed. He's from Texas. I'm from Louisiana. And his grandparents raised him and they were well to do. So he doesn't know. He didn't know how it was like to be without or whatever. So I had him laughing yesterday. He said, we were going down on the country roads day before yesterday. And I said, babe, can you believe my daddy used to make me ride all the way down here from Shreveport all the way past Gringo, which is the woods for real. I say for $25, 25 freaking dollars. Oh my God. I said, boy, if I'd have known then what I know now, that pastor would have never had a <laughs> But you know what? To God be the glory. It was a learning experience. And it was that was just the day and time. And back then, $25 was some money. But to think now how far we rolled to get $25, Jesus Christ. And then you be in church from 9 in the morning to 12 midnight. You remember them days? Yes. <laughs> every day oh, of the week. Yes. He said every day of the week. I saw, and he laughed so hard. I said, but you know what? I thank God for my upbringing. But being in a situation where I never wanted to struggle, I've never used drugs to this day. I've never drank to this day, never even smoked a cigarette. I always felt like I was crazy without the drugs, you know, because I, I always mean when I say, I tell people sometimes, oh, you know, I can be half hood. I can be half holy. You know, the best thing to do is pray with me. Don't play with me. I was that person, you know? Yeah. yeah. I thank God for it. For um, everything, being a drug dealer at the age of 16 and climbing out the window when my dad would go to sleep at night because we had to be in the bed at 8 o'clock. I still, my, my grandson is six. We just turned seven. And this little boy studies the stock market. And he he and he, he and his brother just published their first book. And they just got found with talent agent. And he comes up and he said, oh, do you know that Elon Musk's net worth is $119 billion? I said, boy, at the age of seven, I couldn't even count to 100. Yeah. Did you know? Because my dad and them kept us so we didn't what they we didn't know what these gen, this generation knows now. But right. even then, I knew that I never wanted to be broke. Right. I never wanted to be busted and disgusted, and and I wanted to have more than what what they gave. Not saying that I didn't have a good upbringing because they raised us right. Right. That's it's right. just that I just published a book last Thursday. 
I wrote it in three days. I asked God to give it to me. I said, Lord, I need you to give me something. I want to make a quarter of a million dollars in six months on my own without my allowance. And so God gave me that book. And the book says, prison, please prepare me. But the first thing people will think is for people in prison. No, you don't have to be in prison to be in prison. Right. Because, see, my dad and them didn't teach us what they couldn't know. They couldn't teach us what they didn't know. And so my book, it says, you don't know what you don't know. Right. That's a right. lot of people don't, they can't give what they don't have to give because if you don't know it, you can't give it. That's a fact. So they gave us God and that was most important. Mm -hmm. But the financial literacy and the, the savings and teaching me how to balance a checkbook and how to write a check, I never learned that from them. Mm -hmm. I learned to trust God, go to church, go to school, get an education and to work for somebody. And to this day, I've never worked for nobody. Praise the Lord. But I've had some situations. My choices put me in in circumstances and situations that my dad and my mom were not pleased with. So I sold drugs from sixteen to nineteen without them so, knowing. Yeah. So so let's talk about that. We at the age of sixteen, like what what like you made a decision that you were going to sell drugs. Like, what was your first step like to go and just, you know. Get and the thing was, I didn't even miss more, but I didn't even make the decision. I went to a party with my brother. So my dad had other kids before he married my mom. And right. so my brother was like 10 or 11 years older than me. And he wanted to use the car to go to a party. So we going from the country back to the city, which is 30, 40 miles. And my dad was like, oh, you can go. He telling my brother, oh, you can go, but you got to take Chuck with you. That's my nickname, Chuck. Be uh -huh. my nickname. I was born. <laughs> so he says, you have to take her with you. And he gets there and it's at our, my old babysitter's house in the backyard and my best friend from kindergarten and her cousin pulls up in this Mercedes. I've never seen him. I had never seen a Mercedes in my life. Right. With the table in the inside in the back seat. I was like, whoa. Yeah. You know, is this some kind of out of space car? What the heck? So long story short, my brother ended up leaving with a girl uh -huh. and then they can get me. Now he wasn't even supposed to go nowhere without me, but he left me right. and ended up getting a ride home with the cousin. Right. Because he was going there anyway. Right. Because he had people that were in the country that were actually selling drugs for him. Oh. That's what he was. That's how he got the car. Right. Kingpin. So I get the ride home with him. And by them being, his mom being my dad's friend all her life. So my dad trusts me with them. Yep. And not knowing that, oh, he goes to this drug house. And, and it's the first time I've ever seen people on drugs. You know, I'm raised in church on the morning bench. I don't know nothing but church and school. And to see these people on drugs. And, and I say it all the time. This is so ironic. I tell people when I'm mentoring, I say, let me tell you something. Satan is so conniving. He'll trick the sleeves off you because he make you think you can when you know you can't. And that's how the cocaine was with these drug addicts. These people were trying to jump out the windows with the windows down. How are you going to jump out the window and the window is down? Mm -hmm. And so that was my first time ever being around that kind of stuff. You know, it was scary, but then he explained to me like, Oh, you can make so much money doing this. And so he gave me my first bag of cocaine. He was like, get the girl to cook it for you and this, that, and the other. And she was beating me because she was from L.A. She was six, yep. six. She knew the game and she knew I was from the country. And, you know, the people from up north and up and, and the, the west coast and the east coast, they think the southern people are kind of not as fast as them. So she was getting me, though. She was getting me every time. So when I learned, when I told him like how much money I had after so many months, he was like, oh, she really getting you. You know what I'm saying? So he stopped me from having to work with her and mm -hmm. had somebody to teach me how to cook the drugs right. myself. Right. So now I'm making more money. And then I started being convicted. And so I was like, God, every time I would go out to sell drugs, when I go home, I would get sick. Mm. And I would regurgitate. And I would throw up every, it was just God trying to already stop me, but I was hard. Right. I always say this, the quality of your decisions always determines the quality of your lifestyle. Yeah. So whatever you 
whatever choices you make, you're going to have to deal with the consequences. So by the age of 19, I, I, I'm slick now. My dad, um, I get busted with three kilos of cocaine in his house. Uh-uh, I'm going to do that now. And so I'm thinking because he's the preacher, I'm seven months pregnant with my son who was killed. I'm thinking because he's the preacher, if I had the drugs in his car, if the police can't say, I told you the devil tricked you. Yeah. He tricked the fleas off me. So he makes me feel like, oh, as long as I keep it in my dad's car or at my dad's house, and he's a preacher and everybody in the country knows him, they'll never search his car. They'll never search the house where he lives because he's an AME preacher. Mm -hmm. And that was not the case. The police come. I get set up by a guy that I've been dealing with. They come years. to the house? The house. Okay. My dad wasn't even there. He had gone to take my mom to work. Now, yeah. my mom, she never gave me the benefit of that because I always, she felt like, oh, yeah, Chuck, she thinks she has slick, you know? My dad, I was a daddy's girl. So in his eyes, I did no wrong. So they come. And when they come, they, um, I, they, 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 the guy comes and he says, oh, you know, um, I want to buy five ounces of cocaine. I said, okay, give me a second. By the time I turned around to walk away and I turned back, he said, oh, I changed my mind because somebody else around the corner is going to sell it to me for 3500 instead of 5000 I was like, okay, but you've been buying from me for over a year. Why you haven't been getting in my mind I'm thinking it, but then I'm not, I'm so unfocused. So I don't really give it a second thought. I think it and then I don't think it. So I walk off. So about 30 minutes to 45 minutes later, he comes back. By this time, my dad is on his way back from taking my mom to work. So I go to give him the drugs and the police just kick the doors in and come through the windows and it was just the worst ever. And now my dad is pulling up in the yard. So the police just bring him on in the house. And he just looked at me with tears in his eyes and he was just, he was hurt. He was broken. And I know he was just like, I cannot believe you. Right. And guess what he did? He told the police that those were his drugs and he took the charge. Oh he thought he was going to get probation because he was a preacher. And they gave him 15 years. Ooh. Oh my gosh. Yes. And so my mom divorced him because she said he loved me more than he loved her and married a deacon from the church. Mm -hmm. And um, I would still go and play for his friend, go to choir her to every Saturday. I ended up having my baby. And I actually went back to try to take my charge myself, but they wouldn't let me. They gonna make an they were gonna, they were determined to make an example out of me because of how you know he took the charge. Oh man. So, Yes, it was the worst. So your daddy takes the oh Lord. Before I say that this that I want to say like everybody walking around here has a story, and for me like I'm like my story is so horrible like I I didn't even want to tell people. And then you meet somebody whose story is like is is more unique than yours, right? So like your dad takes the fifteen year. I mean, so they they charge him. They give him the fifteen. They give him fifteen years. You try to go back. And take it, and they wouldn't let you. Oh no, they just had a vengeance for me. They were just like, "Oh, you know what? It's coming sooner than later." But see, he, my dad took the choice, thinking that okay, I'm going that she's gonna stop right. because he told me you have just like I said at the beginning of the interview. He says your gift will make room for you. You're so smart. You can do anything. Open a business, do something else. I always wanted to open a skate rink. I don't know why. But he was like, do that or do something. But I'm sitting here because I don't ever want you to be exposed to the prison life. That's what he said. And every Saturday, I would go to the country and play for him, do choir rehearsal for his friend. And I would drive to go visit him in prison. And so one Saturday when I went, I was so crazy. This is the worst. So I I always could draw. Every All of my talent is in my head. I can write a song in 15 minutes. I wrote a book in three days. I wrote a play, a screenplay 
and performed it in less than three months and I wrote it in one day, in one week, I'm sorry. And it was standing room only. Every Everything that I need, God gave it to me in my hands. And so my dad said, you could do so much. He said, but I took this choice because I don't ever want you to see the inside of a prison. And so he said, you got to stop. Chuck, you got to stop. Me with my crazy self, I go and draw a blueprint of a crack machine. <laughs> I have to let this see, girl. I drew a picture. I'm expecting that. <laughs> I have to laugh at myself because I'm real. I was a silly sinner for real. <laughs> like, oh, like, who thinks of that, right? Yes. But only Leticia Chantel Scott Jackson would <laughs> think of that. So it was going to be made like a mailbox and it was going to be made out of concrete. With my crazy stuff, anything that, that's built can be torn down. People, if you listen to this, anything that's built can be torn down. But in my mind, at that time, my little silly mind was thinking, if I make it out of concrete, then I put the $10 slots, the $20 slots, and the 100 All I wanted was three slots, yeah. 10 20 <laughs> and it was going to go like through a little tunnel. I had it all figured out. So at this particular time during the 90s, when you, you know, the prisons, when it was, they were not as strict as they are now. So I didn't snuck, I didn't snuck the paper in there. And I give it, and I show it to him, and he just started crying. He said, "You done went all the way crazy." He said, "And you're gonna be buried up under the prison because they're gonna lock you up and throw the key away if you don't quit, or you're gonna end up dead." Right. He said, "So you promised me." He told me, "Look him in his eye and promise him that I will stop," and I did that. I I made the promise because I saw he was hurt. I never seen him cry. I leave that day. And for maybe two or three weeks, I tried to stop. It's like, oh, I'm not going to do it myself. I just let other people do it for me. Like, I'm really thinking I'm slick, right? It, it, it doesn't work like that. But I was so used to the life, living that life and doing in the fast money and just doing what I was doing. And believe it or not, I never accomplished nothing because every time I would get a bulk of money, I either got robbed or somebody went to jail. I had to burn them out of jail. I mm -hmm. sold drugs all my life to get a Rolex watch and a Maserati. That's all I ever wanted. And I never got it while I was selling drugs. Yeah. But now guess what? I got a brand new Maserati in the garage paid for. I got a brand new purple Bentley in the car in the garage paid for. I wear Rolexes every day. <laughs> if I want to. Come on, so, you yeah. better hear me. Yeah. And it's all paid for. I don't have no debt. Oh my God. Because listen, the drug money is devil money. I was, it is. yeah, and I was raised in the church. I in your story, like I, I'm listening to your story, been there, done that. I did that. I wasn't, it wasn't drugs was not put before me. I chose to do it and I accomplished nothing. nothing. I went to prison and accomplished nothing. It was when I went to prison that I realized this is not the life for me. I need to change mm -hmm. it. So let's talk about, you know, the blueprint. You done wrote that and up. So, yeah, I broke it. My daddy ripped it up. He was just like, okay. you, 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 you're going to be in prison for the rest of your life if you don't stop. Mm -hmm. So you, I attempted to stop. It didn't work. And after I had my son, I instantly started back selling drugs. And and I he basically had hit rock bottom because paying for attorneys and doing all this stuff. And then when my dad get busted, now mind you, I still got to pay these people for their drugs. Yep. So I'm in debt now. I don't have nothing to work. I got to work it out. And so all of that happened. And I moved. I, they arrested me. So this is the honest to God truth. So my daughter's father, and I don't care if he listens. I hope he hears this. And no, <laughs> listen. So my daughter's father and I, we never really had a relationship. So we have intercourse. I get pregnant one time. I don't like him no more. But we both selling drugs in the same city. I'm front him drugs from time to time because he's my child's father. Right. But he thinks because he's my child's father, he don't have to pay me. So I'm giving him nine ounces of cocaine at a time. Not no little drugs, mm. big drugs. And he, yeah, so he, you know, I had to get him straight a couple of times. And the thing was, once we fell out, he told me, he said, you're going to prison. I'm going to send you to prison. The baby daddy? Yeah, he said, you're going to prison, Chuck Scott. I said, okay. And so are you. We both going at the same time because we both doing the same thing. And eventually, we both ended up going. The very next year, I, after my I promised my dad that, guess what happens? 
I get secret indicted by the feds. The feds, when they come to get you, they don't have, they've already dotted all of their eyes. Right. So that you better be listening to somebody that's watching this interview. Yes. When the feds come to get you, right. all of their eyes are already dotted and all of their T's are already crossed. So without a shadow of a doubt, they already know that they don't miss. Right. They don't miss, especially if they got you right to the right. So I get picked up by the, I get indicted, I get trapped, in trap. This lady comes up to me, I'm in a spot, and she introduced herself to me, and she was an older lady, looked like an Indian. She was so pretty. And she wanted to be my babysitter. That's what she said. Oh, I see you out here with your baby, because baby, I have my baby out there with me on the corner. My son, I have an older daughter, but my mom kept her all the time. I would take my son with me. So I put the drugs in the stroller. You know, I'm on the block. I'm doing my thing, trying to shake back. And um, she was like, oh, I'll watch your baby for you. The whole time she was married to the DEA agent. So now I'm letting her in my house. I'm letting her keep my baby in the apartment. I got two different spots I'm staying in. And the whole time she's introduced me to this guy who was supposed to be her cousin. And he was the feds. Yeah. Yeah, so that happened, and um, one day, and they, and they made they waited till they got me to the right. So they, they I, I sold to him three different times before they entrapped me. Yeah. And this, and so this particular day, they entrapped me. They put it in the newspaper. My dad reads it in prison and have a stroke. Oh my god! And it paralyzed the left side of his body. So. The, my first offer was life at the age of 21. Ooh. And my lawyer was like, they I'm not. For, so what did they have you on? Distribution of cocaine. It was distribution. Okay. Distribution. But remind you, I had already, I was already on the run from when my daughter's dad set me up. So I had went to jail and bonded it out on a $100,000 bond and I never did go back. So, yeah, they were sick of me, right? They was just tired of me. The judge said when I went to court, oh, you're just a menace to society. We're sick of you, baby. Right. So, but God is so faithful and he's so, he said he knew that I was going to get out and, and do some different things and, and that my living would not be in vain and, and the journey that I went on, it would be able to help somebody else. So he says, listen, on the day of sentencing, my lawyer asked for a 30-day speedy trial. 30 day speedy trial. I mean, and guess what happened? I ended up in court on the 30th day. Now they don't have my records, they can't find me. So he got to sentence me on what's before him, or he got to let me go. He sentenced me on what was before him. What was before him? Just the fact that I had that one drug charge in the other city, remember? Right. When I put it out. That was it? I had never been in no more other trouble. And guess what? I got five, I had 13 years, basically, federal. Five years, federal time. Six months, federal boot camp. Eight years, federal supervised release. Nobody but God. Yes. And my mom fainted in the courtroom. She was like, Jesus Christ. And guess what? She died at the end of my sentence at the age of 42. So she never got to see me change. Never. My gosh. What happened to your dad? He got out and he died. Did and he then my your change? Oh, yes. And then my son. He didn't see me on this journey now. We both basically got out around the same time. So then, you know, I was trying, but I was struggling because I was married to somebody that was not, um, we were not equally yoked. Yes. yes. But we didn't have the same mindset. Yes. yes. So I was struggling because I'm trying to do one thing. He was doing something else. And he passed away two years ago on New Year's Day, my daughter's father. So it's just been one thing back after another, back to back. Oh. Yes, but it didn't do anything but made me strong. But guess what? My son's my son gets killed June 1st, 2008. God showed me three days in a row he was going to die. After you he, got out? Yes, he was my only son. Aww. I have four daughters, but he was my only son. He was next to the oldest. Oh, and so once um he got killed, I was like broken. I was mad. We got to stop going to church. 
I was already mad because my daddy died because I was like, God, you take, you took everybody that I really loved. I don't want to get emotional, but I'm like, I thought we were cool. I thought you loved me. You say you got like, I'm supposed to be able to depend on you and I can't depend on nobody else. And then you let my mama die. Then my daddy, then my grandmother, then my only son. Oh, I'm done with you. Say like chills go through me. Oh my God. I said, I'm done with you for real. I'm not hitting none of the lick on nobody's piano. I'm not giving none of the tide. I'm not doing nothing. I'm not doing nothing because you hurt me because you showed me he was going to die. And I asked you not to do that to me. He showed me three days in a row. Every time he showed me, I said, God, don't let him die. Let me die. What did you see? What did he show you? It was a dream. There was some, and it is so crazy. This, these Jamaican drug dealers were killing, were sacrificing him, killing him. Every night, the same dream. And I said, don't do this. Please don't do this to me. I'm not going to be no more good. I'm dying with him if he dies. And that Sunday morning, I got up and mm -hmm. I, I had the dream and I went back to sleep. But I got up early because I played for my dad's friend up until my son died. And my dad always told me, don't you ever stop playing for Reverend Jones. And I would drive four hours and 15 minutes one way to church every Sunday. To choir rehearsal well, every practice. Tuesday. I was going to say, you go to choir, you go practice. On Tuesday. And then go back on Sunday. And well, he, my son's funeral was at my church. And so I was done. And so. It yeah, was too much. It was too much. And I'm sitting in church that Sunday. Well, after I woke up that morning, it was like nine. I called his phone, kept calling his phone, and he was real responsible. We had just opened the clothing store. Then we went on our third clothing store. And um, I called the phone, and he didn't answer. Mm -hmm. So now my stomach is getting nervous. You know how you feel when you, yeah. you're, unsettled? you're unsettled? And so I'm unsettled, but I'm like, okay. I'm, I already know if I'm late for church, Reverend Jones going to dock my pay. And we ain't playing. We know we're not playing with him today. That's the point. <laughs> no, we're not playing. So I called back and he answered. Your son? I could, yes, I heard, a, I heard a wind blowing. He's talking. He's like, Mama, you know I'm not going to have you late for church. I know Reverend Jones be tripping. That's what he said. That was the last. I said, okay, Al, I love you. Just come on. He's like, hey, Mom, I love you too. I'm coming. You know I know Reverend Jones be tripping. And that was the last thing he said to me.